Good evening, this is Utaking Seminar and today is January 7th. I'm just going to say a regular hello since seven days have already passed from New Year's. Um, today's topic is animation director Hayao Miyazaki and Raputa, Castle in the Sky, but there's no time to chit chat today, really. I'm going to make this clear, but today's topic will not fit in just one broadcast. So, I'll do the first half today and the second half next week. I thought I could finish this in one broadcast, but as I started preparing, um, well, I noticed it wasn't that easy, so I'll spend enough time on this. But instead, I want to make sure that this will be the final version for Raputa. I'll talk with an assumption that all of you have watched Raputa, so I don't need to worry about spoilers, do I? Um, I've titled the series The Chronicle of Ghibli Wars, and today's episode is Raputa. The reason is because when I researched about Raputa, I wanted to talk about Porco Rosso. And if I talk about Porco Rosso, I'd want to also discuss the castle of Cogliostro thoroughly. Then I started wondering like, oh, then what about Princess Mononoke? And so on. As a result, I was like, oh, then I'll need to feature all Ghibli movies, which include all movies by Isao Takahata as well. So I've decided to start from Future Boy Conan and continue till the latest work. It'll be titled The Chronicle of Ghibli Wars. I want to basically discuss how Takahata Miyazaki and producer Toshio Suzuki have battled through their anime making warlords and how Ghibli collapsed. Well, they didn't collapse, but how they once dissolved and then eventually came back together. Friday Roadshow is now showing three Ghibli works in a row. Kiki's Delivery Service on January 5th, Tales from Earthsea on the 12th, and The Castle of Cagliostro on the 19th. Well, I could also discuss each movie in this order, but I'd rather discuss them in my preferred order, which makes it easier to talk about or discuss. A comment just said that it would take at least half a year to discuss them all, but basically, I want to feature one movie a month, so I'll discuss Raputa today and Porco Rosso around next month. That's the kind of pacing I'm planning right now. So, today is the first episode of this series, Raputa, Castle in the Sky, came out in 1986. First, I want to discuss what was going on inside Ghibli around this time. To do that, I made this chronological table of Ghibli. This is it. The real chronology should be more detailed, like when the comic version of Naushka started around here, or it got suspended, etc. But those are not included here. I just wrote down what was necessary for today. First, Future Boy Conan was aired in 1978, and Castle of Cogliostro was shown in theaters in December 1979. I think this was the first evaluation period of Miyazaki. Miyazaki made 26 episodes for NHK called Future Boy Conan, which is based on a novel titled The Incredible Tide. People quickly acknowledged his talent. Then he made Castle of Cagliostro, which was his first feature film. This was the first evaluation period. Well, he was still only known within the anime industry then. However, as you all know, this was a major, what is it, historical box office bomb, and Miyazaki was instantly deprived of making a movie. But after five years of silence, he released Naushka of the Valley of the Wind in March 1984, and he also worked on its comic version during this time. Then finally Raputa was released in August 1986. There is a two-year gap between those two pieces because the staff were disbanded after Naushka, and then reassembled for Raputa, which added extra unnecessary work. The reason I also listed Grave of the Fireflies, which was Takahata's work, here is because Raputa became the last work that Takahata produced. Or, you can say, Miyazaki became independent from Takahata after Raputa. It means their ideological differences became clear, or Miyazaki finally graduated from the school of Takahata. And Miyazaki no longer needed to be produced by him after Raputa.
Uh, you can tell that Takahata complained a lot about Raputa, while Miyazaki also said things about Takahata as the grave of the fireflies, and only yesterday. He was like, gee, why would he do that? So it's clear Raputa was the turning point where their ideologies completely diverged from each other. Then, My Neighbor Totoro and The Grave of the Fireflies were released in 1988. Totoro is highly rated now, but Totoro and The Grave of the Fireflies um, did pretty poorly in theaters. So, actually, Naushka was the only one that was a box office success compared to other pieces. But although I won't call Raputa a complete failure, it still didn't recoup its budget in theaters, which they had to make up through VHS sales later on. And as I said, Totoro and The Grave of the Fireflies were flops. Ghibli started making profits from Kiki's delivery service in 1989. So that's the major flow of events. And what did Ghibli do when they suddenly had money in their hands? They made Only Yesterday in 1991, which went into the red. On top of that, Miyazaki and Takahata could no longer work in the same room around this time. In 1992, when Miyazaki made Porco Rosso, even though they were both working for Ghibli, they started working in different studios. Consider this the major historical flow of Ghibli. Now, I talked about this in a rerun on the New Year's Day, so you may all know. When Miyazaki's Future Boy Conan was released, unfortunately, Farewell to Space Battleship Yamato came out. Miyazaki was like, Future Boy Conan is the true sci-fi, this is the anime. It was on the national channel NHK and all that. But because Yamato created a major animation boom, almost no one really appreciated Future Boy Conan, except for some anime buffs. Not only that, when Miyazaki made his first feature film, The Castle of Cogliostro, claiming, I've put in everything that I wanted to express in this piece, the epic series Mobile Suit Gundam began airing on TV almost at the same time, and as a result, all anime magazines, except for Animeju, pretty much only cared about Gundam. We feel that Naushka was so popular back in the days, just because it's been on rerun so many times, but in fact its box office record was not that different from the movie version of Super Dimension Fortress Macross, that came out around the same time. <laughs> Plus, Macross clearly sold more merchandise than Naushka, if we count the sales of related products. That's why the 70s to early 80s, from Future Boy Conan to Raputa, were a complete dark age for Miyazaki, despite the fact that he was allowed to produce films. So, I categorize him as a creator who could not keep up with the so-called first anime boom that started with Space Battleship Yamato and ended with Super Dimension Fortress Macross. But of course, that also means no one at that time really understood how great Miyazaki was. Now, Miyazaki refers to Castle of Cagliostro, Naushka, Raputa, and Totoro as a rectangle. Well, Miyazaki himself talks about this episode in an interview in this stylish magazine called Cut, and he talked a lot there. So, most of what Miyazaki said, which I'll quote, are from this interview. And I'll quote other people from the books I've aligned here. For example, I'll quote from this book called Ghibli's textbook, Raputa, Castle in the Sky. I also thought this book was pretty cool. It's called Another Balse, written by a production assistant of Raputa called Mr. Kihara. And it's got some good stories, so I'll sample them as well. So, for today's broadcast, these published texts will be the basis of what I will discuss in the lecture. Now, as I said earlier, Miyazaki calls Cagliostro, Naushka, Raputa, Totoro a rectangle. So, what that means is that he did everything um, he wanted to do. He tried different approaches for each of those four works, so there was nothing left to do when he was done. So he said, after I finished the four works, I no longer intended to direct anime. I was fed up with it, and I wanted to go back to the position of animator. He said this many times here and there, but accordingly, when he completed Naushka, he requested, let me become an animator again ASAP. 
but pretty much no one who moved up from animator to director then went back down. For example, Yoshikazu Yasuhiko, the character designer of Gundam, started out as an animator, then became a character designer, then a director. That's the career path for almost all animators. Some directors sometimes help others out with drawings, but that's it. But when Naushika was completed, people told Miyazaki, so isn't Naushika 2 coming up next? Despite their expectations, Miyazaki went to Suzuki and yelled. He was emotional rather than mad. He pleaded, I can't stand losing more friends. Because when an animator becomes a director, they gradually get left out by their peer animators because the director's job is to say, this is good or this is bad to their drawings. Miyazaki thought, that's the role of an administrator whom we, the animators, all used to hate when we belong to Toei Animation. It's not what we should do to each other. He knew his fellow animators understood his position because they were a team, but he also understood how animators always found directors a bit annoying. That's why Miyazaki said, I've lost all of my friends through making Naushika. That's why I don't want to be a director ever again. Do you understand how I feel, Suzuki-san? Previously, Miyazaki also cried to Takahata. Takahata-san, please let me help you with your current project as an animator. Takahata was surprised and replied, what, you finally became a director and now you want to become an animator again? But then he thought, oh wait, if Miyazaki comes back to my team, that'll be awesome. So he gave him tons of drawing work for Anne of Green Gables, which he was working on back then and said, okay, here you go. Miyazaki was like, gee, now I'm an animator again. I can't be happier. I'm never going to direct again. Then he began drawing at a furious speed. And before the day was over, he started picking on the drawings of his colleague who was sitting next to him and went, that's wrong, give that to me, and started redoing them like crazy. So he left Anne of Green Gables just like that and started directing the castle of Cogliostro. It sounds like a joke, like a comedy skit by Tokyo Zero Three. That's the kind of man Hayao Miyazaki is. He's got such big mood swings. So, if he thinks he can do something, he tries to do it all. But if he doesn't, then he goes, I'm so useless, and he doesn't just think like that, but also acts upon it. A person like that is described as an instantaneous water heater in Japan. Someone who loses temper quickly and cools down just as fast. But in the case of Miyazaki, he doesn't just lose his temper, but instantly explodes like a nuclear reaction. Anyway, back to the main topic. He said these four works were something he'd always wanted to make, but now, having completed them, he no longer had anything he wanted to do. At least, that's what he was thinking around this time. So he was actually going to let someone else make Kiki's delivery service. That's how accomplished he felt after completing Laputa. And... I think that was his honest opinion, except for Kiki's delivery service, which from halfway, he had to take over in directing. It was only four years after he completed Totoro that he finally decided to make another film, Porco Rosso. For four years, he had nothing that he really wanted to express. So, I think he was pretty serious about saying, I'm done. I've completed the four corners of the rectangle. Then, what kind of movie is Raputa? I think it's a perfect version of the castle of Cagliostro. An earnest princess escapes a villain by herself, and a man saves her. The only difference is that Pazu saves her instead of Rupan. But, either way, a man saves her. But the bad guys come to get her back and steal her. Then the main character gives her up momentarily. Um, which you can see in scenes like where Rupan doesn't know that Clarice was drug dosed and thinks, oh well, it can't be helped. Or Pazu says, Shida told me to forget about Raputa and Dola scolds her. But afterwards, they both fight together with their colleagues, and at the end, they discover a ruin of ancient metropolis, which would be submerged metropolis from the Roman Empire, for the castle of Cogliostro, and a huge castle in the sky for Raputa. So, they resemble each other so closely in terms of their plots. And 
That's because Miyazaki had always wanted to make something similar to a British classic children's literature called Treasure Island by Stevenson. United Kingdom is like the birthplace of children's literature, and Treasure Island is the classic of classics. All works by Miyazaki are basically adaptations of the main plot of Treasure Island. So, it'll be easier to understand his works if you compare them to Treasure Island and think like, so, who would be the equivalent of Captain Silver in this work? But, um, at the same time, Miyazaki had his strong anti-feeling against works like Mobile Suit Gundam, Space Battleship Yamato, and his own work, The Castle of Cagliostro. Because, according to Miyazaki, they all set elites as main characters. Each of them has special skills. For example, Rupon is a genius thief. But for Miyazaki, even Amuro, the main character of Gundam, is a subject of criticism. We think that an ordinary boy like Amuro broke the image of a typical noble and athletic main character in Japanese anime. But Gundam appeared to Miyazaki as an anime where all the main character does is act cool while receiving help from a machine, like the donkey in the lion skin. <laughs> So, Raputa to Miyazaki was an antithesis to Gundam or Rupan. However, this troubled him later on. He wrote on the proposal, I want to make it a story about an ordinary boy. But then he later realized that having an ordinary boy as the main character wouldn't give him any plot. I mean, the villain called Colonel Muska bosses his military around and works for the information bureau of the government, and Dola, his opponent, is a super strong pirate lady. Then, here comes a 12 to 13 year old boy who just tries hard to save the girl. How would he win? Miyazaki went, what am I gonna do now? I thought, then, why did you say such a thing in the first place? Above all, when Miyazaki wrote the first draft and thought, I think this is good, and showed it to Suzuki and Takahata, they scolded him. They said, what's this? You made Muska the main character. Sure, I see you put a little boy called Pazu as the main character. This won't make a blood-tingling anime movie like our slogan says, but a glory and failure of young Muska. A boy who believed in the legend of Raputa, which he had heard from his parents, and thought, one day, I'm going to rebuild the civilization of the people of Raputa. He tries so hard to find and kidnap a girl who succeeds Raputa's imperial bloodline. The girl hates him, so he tries to use words to attract her. But another young boy steals her. He goes through crap until he finally thinks he gets the glory. Then at the very end, the girl betrays him, so he fails and loses everything. Hmm, what a good story about Muska, but is that what you want? Miyazaki said, no! I mean, that original plot is pretty interesting, isn't it? So, um... Uh... What I'm trying to say here is setting an ordinary boy as a main character makes story making pretty difficult. That difficulty influenced the story until the end, where two of them put their hands together and said BALS, which is a word of doom. I just said a word of doom, but what they actually do there is a double suicide. They try to solve the situation by dying together. Which was what Miyazaki did in Naushka, or what Farewell to Space Battleship Yamato did for the climax. Both were a kind of suicide attack. So, that's what I want to analyze in today's lecture. I want to answer a question, then, why did they end up with the same kind of climax? But, that doesn't mean Raputa is the same as Naushka or Farewell to Space Battleship Yamato, in which the story ends with main characters sacrificing their lives. As I said, I've broken down the seminar about Raputa into six sections, and I want to talk about this in the last section, which I titled Growth of the Anime Characters and Hayao Miyazaki. Anyway, Raputa is a strange movie. 
Oh, by the way, I just said there would be six parts, but I didn't even get to the first. I'm about to. Raputa is a strange movie. It only made around $4,600,000 in the box office. It was not a crushing defeat, but also not a good number. But then, they sold many movie merchandise. Totoro sold most goods among all Ghibli movies, but Raputa comes next. Raputa and Naushka come after Totoro, and then Kiki and Porco Rosco follow. Instead of being a blockbuster, Raputa became a movie which people still love. Many say Raputa is my most favorite Ghibli movie. I think I also like Raputa the most, and I've come up with six of its appealing points. So, here is the list of those six points. First, strange eroticism. Then, contradicting cultural criticism. Third, unexplained characters. Fourth, the mysterious industrial revolution. Fifth, a coming-of-age tale of a man. And last, the real Hayao Miyazaki. I want to discuss Raputa as I go through these points. In today's broadcast, I will talk about the first three points from strange eroticism to unexplained characters. And from the fourth to the sixth points, I'll talk about how the industrial revolution portrayed in Laputa is a bit strange. And Raputa is considered to be a coming-of-age tale of a boy, but the main character isn't really Pazu. But those are going to be for next week. Then, let's start talking about the first point, strange eroticism. So, you guys might think, was there any erotic scene in Raputa? Actually, there is. Do you remember this scene? This is a scene where Pazu and Shita somehow managed to land on Raputa with a kite that got separated from Dola's aircraft called Tiger Moth. After they land, they go, yay! Then they hug and roll on the grass. It's Pazu and Shita in that scene. Now, there's a long interview about this scene in this stylish magazine called Cut. The interview is super long. There, the interviewer told Miyazaki, there is a scene in Raputa which I don't really get. And he referred to this scene. It's this. So, right here. He said, I have one complaint about Raputa. That's when Pazu and Shita land on the castle and celebrate. They roll on the grass while they are tied together with a rope. Aren't they supposed to kiss in a situation like that? They even hug and look at each other. Hearing that Miyazaki responded, no, I think the movie did enough of that. The movie did enough of what? said the interviewer. Miyazaki said, you know the kite scene? But suddenly paused and added, oops, I've been told not to say things like this, but... In the first draft where Shita holds onto Pazu from the back inside the kite, Shita wasn't holding Pazu tightly enough. Pazu should be feeling her breasts on his back. That's why he has this confident look on his face. So I told the animator who drew this, did you think that far? And he said, uh, no. So I ordered him, imagine that and draw again. Then he did his best. The interviewer was like, I didn't know it was such an erotic movie. Well, let me continue reading the article. I didn't know it was such an erotic movie. Well, it's not that I'm hiding them intentionally. That kind of thing is necessary for movie making. It's not fashion like in Space Battleship Yamato, where the characters look at the camera when they hug. When I saw it, I was like, what? So you guys look away from each other? So it's a typical Miyazaki always dissing someone else's work when he explains his own work. So for this scene, the interviewer asked, why don't Pazu and Shita kiss here? Then Miyazaki said, because instead of telling it, that kind of thing is already shown in the movie. That's probably what he meant by the movie did enough. 
That's the scene where Pazu and Shita get on this kite for observation and go up higher in the sky. Suddenly, there is a blast and it blows the kite away. Shita gets scared and holds on to Pazu tightly. Then, Pazu turns around to look at her in order to relax her, but his facial expression isn't strong enough. So, Miyazaki scolded the animator. You don't get it, do you? Imagine a girl you love gets scared, hugs you and presses her small breasts onto you. You feel them on your back. And, is this how your face looks in a situation like that? No! Do it again! And when Miyazaki saw the second draft, he said, that's better! So that's where the boy's confident look comes from. Men can only act reliable when they physically feel the reliance of women. Miyazaki said, that's what anime is supposed to depict! <laughs> so, Miyazaki's anime is erotic, but that's different from um, the cheap eroticism that we usually think of. I should have said this before, but Miyazaki is a man who hates something being cheap more than anything. Where was it? Uh, huh? Oh, here. I discovered about a week ago when I was reading past interviews of Miyazaki endlessly. So... That's just Osamu Tezuka, is his signature phrase. He thinks of Tezuka, the great pioneer of manga, as his imaginary enemy. When someone says, why don't we develop the story like this? He immediately snaps back, that sounds like what Tezuka does, so no! Well, not that Tezuka would have really done what Miyazaki said. One of my favorite episodes is a discussion about what to do with the last scene of Naushka. In the last scene, we know a herd of Ohm run into Naushka, and she gets blown away by them and dies. Then she comes back to life with the phrase, that person wearing a blue robe shall stand in a golden field. But Miyazaki had several different ideas. One idea was that after Naushka gets hit by Ohm and dies, Ohm take Naushka with them when they return to the toxic jungle. The idea indicates that Naushka may come back to life, but even so, she won't return to the human world. Both Ohm and Naushka abandon humans and return to the forest. The remaining humans used to think they could survive as long as Ohm didn't attack them, but they now realize that the true hope was Naushka. This ending proposes a question of what happens to humans when they lose hope. Miyazaki told this version to Takahata and said, Oh, that ending will do. And Miyazaki answered, No, that sounds like Tezuka's idea. I mean, I also think it's a pretty good ending. But Miyazaki rejected that idea because for him, it was too Tezuka-ish. Another idea Miyazaki came up with was that Ohm become adult insects. Those Ohm in the movie are larvas. Yeah, they're actually giant caterpillars. So after that climax scene with Naushka, the Ohm backs crack open and huge wings come out. Then they fly away to space. So Ohm don't destroy humans, instead they abandon the Earth and move to a different planet. Then the Earth pretty much becomes a place without any god. It's kind of like waiting for Godot. Then it eventually turns into an abandoned place like east of Eden. Miyazaki said all this in the interview in cut. But when the interview said, oh, that sounds like a great ending, he said, no, it's not Miyazaki, it's what Tezuka would do. What I want to say here is that the part where he mentioned Tezuka is not that important, but it tells us how Miyazaki is a guy who isn't satisfied with normal ideas. He literally comes up with 50 to 60 ideas, but rejects 99% of them. He narrows them down until he goes, this must be it. To do so, he refuses any ideas that are visually cool or appealing to the audience with no compromise. That's how much he refuses cheapness. So, back to where I was. That's why he never depicts eroticism as a cliché. But at the same time, he knows that excluding all erotic depictions is also nonsense. What he meant by the movie did everything necessary is that it's your fault for watching my movies and not understanding the eroticism because I did put it in there. But he thinks he's not stupid enough to visualize them in a straightforward way. So, what I wanted to talk about today is that people often say Raputa sends us a message to go back to nature, or that people cannot live apart from the land. 
But those are the lines spoken by the characters, not the themes. Those are all Tezuka stuff, which Miyazaki would refuse to do. Tezuka may have come up with ideas like, do humans really need technology? Humans should go back to nature. Technology needs to have the warmth of people, so the digital world is no good. Miyazaki would refuse them because it's what his imaginary enemy, Tezuka, would come up with. That's when he says, that's Tezuka stuff, so no, that's Miyazaki. So please think of Miyazaki as someone who wants a twist in anything he expresses. Um, so, where was I? Hmm. I was talking about how Raputa tries to depict very erotic things. For example, this is a scene where Pazu helps Shita who falls from the sky. This one. Shida is wearing plain clothes, and when she floats in the air, she is weightless. But when Pazu catches her, she suddenly becomes heavy. In other words, she becomes substantial. At this point, her breasts look pretty flat. They are drawn very small. They almost look like a wrinkle of her clothes. Maybe it's a bust line, or maybe not. You might wonder, so is that Miyazaki's taste? But that's not it. Next picture. This is a scene where Shita sends Pazu home and is in despair afterwards. Then she recites a spell which she learned from her mom. Save me and revive the eternal light. As soon as she does that, the levy stone on her chest starts sparkling. Because the levy stone is on the center of her chest, that's where the light illuminates. Sure, but then he intentionally drew in the shadow casting on the sides of her breasts to describe their volume. He did that intentionally because that's what he wanted to show. And he did it well. Because this is not a scene where eroticism comes in. We feel it's our fault for thinking something naughty from a scene like this. Miyazaki made us think like that intentionally. And... So, this clever scene, that's why this scene also, this, oh, oh, wait. This scene, the light of Raputa returns to the stone. Now, look at Shita's clothes. It's baggy, and that's intentional. When the stone sparkles, her clothes flap. Then, if you look carefully, you can see her upper arms to shoulders, and she might be naked because you don't see her wearing underwear. You can't see it clearly, but you can catch glimpses of her body. But the audience understands that's because of the energy released from the stone. But if that's the truth, there's no need to dress her in such fluffy clothes with open sleeves that flap so easily. The only reason for doing this is to show her clothes flapping to the audience. But at the same time, he doesn't want them to think this is an erotic scene, although he wants them to get excited. That's why he chooses to make this type of erotic depiction in a suspenseful scene like this one. For example, the movie starts with a scene where an aircraft is flying. Then, the Dola family attacks it. Shita notices they intruded into the aircraft and escapes out a window. But when she goes outside, a strong wind lifts up her skirt all the way up to her thighs. But this is also a serious scene where her life is at stake. So it doesn't seem like an erotic scene. Miyazaki always puts in scenes like this in his movies, a scene where a girl's skirt flips up to her thighs, but those scenes make us feel guilty for thinking, oh, I can almost see her underwear. But it's us who are perverted for having such shameful ideas. The guilt is the lust. I know one guy who does something similar, Steven Spielberg. When Spielberg made Jaws, he showed so many scenes where the shark bites off people's legs. He visualized those legs bleeding or missing to indicate that the shark attacked the victims. Then, in one middle scene in the movie, the main character, Chief Brody's youngest son, is playing at a beach, and the shark appears. 
Brody sees it and dashes to the beach. Then he finds his son on the sand unconscious. After that, a scene shows the son being dragged on the sand, but the camera doesn't show his legs. That's nasty. Instead, the screen shows the small son's face at first, and gradually, as the boy gets dragged, the belly button, the thighs, and finally, the unharmed legs. What it does is, it makes the audience anticipate and fear at the same time. They imagine, does the boy have his legs or no? Why is the boy unconscious? Why is Chief Brody's face all pale? Why are people surrounding the boy doing nothing but standing? When the child is being dragged, the audience is possessed by contradictory emotions of hoping that the legs are still there and slightly expecting the guilty pleasure of seeing the legs bitten off. Spielberg knew this guilt creates fear. When we see horror movies, what's best is to see something scary happen. We unconsciously hope to encounter fear. If nothing happens after scary events are indicated, we feel relieved, but we still unconsciously hope that the main characters in the movie have scary experiences. That's how our guilt creates a sense of fear. Similarly, Miyazaki sets up a premise by saying, these aren't erotic scenes. Then he takes advantage of our minds that still see eroticism from those scenes. That's how he creates erotic scenes. That's why, well, in a scene like this, for example, here, or here, all of these erotic depictions are done in um, suspenseful scenes, and I mean, this, well, someone commented on the screen. Compared to this early stage of the movie where Pazu meets Shita, her breasts here have gotten unmistakably bigger. You see? They're bigger. Everything happens in two to three days, so it's not like, yeah, girls grow fast. Miyazaki just had to draw her like this because at this point, Shita has started taking advantage of her femininity. And it's not just about sex appeal. What I want to say is that Miyazaki is a type of creator who also depicts, how should I say, the power of women. So, this is a scene where Shita cooks inside the kitchen of the tiger moth. Do you, do you remember the scene? Shita is ordered to work in the kitchen of the tiger moth. Then, Dola's sons find her in the kitchen and find her cute as soon as they see her. Then, one after another they go, can I do something to help? As a result, Shita bosses everyone around. So it's that scene, not only the sons, but also other minor characters are all helping her. But what's important here is to wonder, what was Shita thinking when these minor characters started helping her in the kitchen? Because Miyazaki doesn't show Shita's face in this scene. On the other hand, just think, what if this was a regular anime? I'm pretty sure a regular anime would show the girl's face and make her say, My bad! Oh, because people offer to help me! Hehe. <laughs> so, the character shows her emotion. Or, it would include a dialogue to show how the girl has no intention to take advantage of others because she's simple. That's the normal way to make anime, but Miyazaki does neither of that. He doesn't do that because he thinks that's what Tezuka would do. It's another way of saying normal, so no good. Showing only Shita's back is the best way. By seeing only her back, we can still tell that Shita knows that she's popular among the guys inside the ship. That's why she orders them one after another to help. But she doesn't order Pazu because she's in love with him. That means Shita doesn't use a guy she loves, but she will boss those who have a crush on her, which she doesn't care about. That's what Miyazaki really thinks. It's manifested more obviously in the castle of Cagliostro, where Kent Cagliostro grabs Clarice by her chin and says, Have you already learned how to control men? I guess it runs in your blood. We see that and may think like, no, Count Cagliostro, you misunderstand her. Clarice is not that kind of girl. But as we see Clarice not denying what he says for a split second, we also think, wait, this is not the first time? There is this powerful Clarice in the beginning of the movie where she steals a car and drives it like a maniac. And halfway through, another Clarice who only cries in front of Lupin from the middle. Those images just don't match. 
It means that Clarice becomes a weak girl after she meets Rupan. Before that, she was a strong girl. And when Rupan is about to leave, she doesn't say, quit thieving and live with me. Instead, she says, I'll join you in steal too. Like that, she's in a way, a smart girl. I'm not making an assertion. However, by not showing her face, but only her back in the scene, I think Miyazaki is trying to say women are powerful. People often discuss how Dola is smart and powerful. But then, Dola herself says, Oh, Shita, that girl will become like me in the future. It's not so obviously depicted because the boys who watch the movie have to fall in love with her. But he still drew her back to make sure whoever sees it gets the hint. <laughs> well, that's what I call Miyazaki's movie making technique. It's also how he sees eroticism which he wants to depict. He wants to draw inside the girl's skirts, their boobs and thighs, but he doesn't want them to be seen as erotic scenes. He thinks today's animators put in those images and go, you like that, huh? So do I. And he thinks that's really vulgar. He wouldn't depict Clarice based on his preferences. So he would say, watch, the wind rises. Even though I love Zero Fighter Plane so much, I haven't put in a single air combat scene. Because again, Miyazaki believes if he did that, he would turn into Tezuka. The reason why I feature Miyazaki's anime in a series is because, really, I want everyone to like Hayao Miyazaki. People wonder, Ghibli is a tough work environment for the animation staff, so how come no one leaves? Or, if everyone acknowledges Miyazaki's talent, why do many directors run away from Ghibli? This is also Miyazaki's charm. I want to spend time on discussing this as well. Um... So let's move on to the next topic, contradicting cultural criticism. Now the opening of Raputa is, oh my god, just wonderful. Any movie creator in the world would dream to make an opening like that. They'd be like, if I could make an opening like that, I could die happy. So I'll go through the opening cut by cut to analyze the structure of Raputa. I'll also discuss how Mamoru Oshii severely attacked Raputa in his book. Miyazaki's cultural criticism is so random. Well, how should I say? Um, Oshii said, there's no fundamental difference between Pazu's coal mine and Raputa. They are both civilizations ruled by machines. Miyazaki-san says, one of them has warmth, but they're the same. Pazu makes airplanes, too, and that's also a modern civilization. So, why is one bad and the other good? He's just forcing us to appreciate what he appreciates. Now, is Oshi right? First of all, he misunderstood two things about Raputa. First, he thought Raputa was an anime that sends an ecological message like humans have to live with nature, they can't leave the land. The second misunderstanding was that he believed Miyazaki makes work based on his preferences. So he would criticize a modern civilization in one movie, but talk about how great machines are in another. Therefore, he's not worth admiring. I'd say both are wrong. So, if cultural criticism is not the main theme of Raputa, then what is it? Well, that's what I will talk about in the second half. So, 45 minutes have already passed before I can get to the opening of Raputa. <laughs> I was going to talk about the strange eroticism in the second half. But then, I felt, how should I say, I felt sorry for the people who can only watch the free part. So, although I wondered if this was the right order, I brought that to the top of the list. So, for those of you who have to stop here, please take out the Raputa DVD and check those scenes I just went over. If you look carefully, you'll see how they really are erotic. Okay, time for a questionnaire. A comment just said, two weeks aren't enough? Yeah, well, maybe you're right, but I think I'll be okay. Uh, another comment, in one word, Raputa is erotic. Well, in one word, Raputa is amazing. Everything in it is amazing, including its eroticism. That's why now I'm going in depth about its characters and settings a bit more. Okay, let me see the result. 
Yes. Oh, nice. Nice. So, what's the percentage? Well, I can see it's over 85%. That's all I need to know. Well, thank you very much. Okay, now let's move on to the second topic of Raputa, and that is contradicting criticism. Now, please switch to the limited part. 